Welcome back. You're watching uh, Global Eye. Let's uh, focus on the Ukraine-Russia war. We don't need a nuclear strike on Ukraine. That was President Putin's message after several hints by Russia about the use of nuclear weapons in the war against Ukraine. Putin accused US, Europe and their allies for seeking global domination by backing Ukraine in the war. Let's now discuss President Putin's strategy with Ajay Malhotra, former Indian ambassador to Russia. Uh, Ambassador Malhotra, many, including the United States and the UK, feel that because of what the Defense Minister of Russia said a few days ago about Ukraine using a dirty bomb, Russia is preparing the ground for such an action. What, according to you, was President Putin's strategy when he was addressing the Russian population and the world? Well, I don't think that would be a correct uh, assessment of the reasons behind uh, uh, President Putin asking his defense minister, Shoigu, uh, to inform several identified countries uh, about the possibility of Ukraine using a dirty bomb. I think they must have picked up some intelligence information, which surely they would have shared. It's not merely a telephone phone call, a call that would have been made. Now, it would be followed up, no doubt, with providing information as to what were the grounds on which the, their intelligence has picked up information uh, as to the likelihood of a, a dirty bomb uh, being made or used in Ukraine or as a false flag operation or whatever. Uh, I think faced then with the uh, blowback that came because there was a slight misrepresentation saying that uh, the Russians are threatening a nuclear attack of some kind in case that happens. Uh, President Putin then has clarified uh, at the Valdai conference that he has no intention of uh, using uh, nuclear weapons against Ukraine, which is uh, the right thing to do. Mm. All right. So uh, you had President Putin downplaying the nuclear threat, saying that they have no intention of doing so. Uh, but in terms of uh, negotiations going forward, we are going to see Russia-Ukraine negotiations again over the next few weeks. Uh, how is Russia going to approach these negotiations? And are, you, are we going to see an intensification of uh, the war effort, the drone attacks? Well, at the moment, there's very little talk about negotiations. In fact, uh, neither the Ukrainians want to come to the table, nor do the Americans uh, want to encourage them to come to the table. I think that would only change after the US congressional elections take place. Uh, which are due on the 8th of November. Mm. You have 35 Senate seats and 435 House of Congress seats that come up for elections. And after that, perhaps there may be a reconsideration. But right now, nobody's talking about uh, negotiations. And therefore, that is some distance away. But the basis for the negotiations and what can be worked right. out from it, I think, is rather clear. If you look at Russia and if you look at Ukraine, mm. both of them are saying, look, my security, I feel threatened. Uh, the arguments might be different, mm. but both say I need some reassurances on security. Ukraine says I want to join NATO or some uh, umbrella over my head. The Russians are saying you are too close. And I cannot have, you know, with the missiles and uh, nuclear weapons being deployed so quickly, uh, I cannot have um, uh, nuclear weapons coming into Ukraine or elsewhere in the ex uh, CIS, uh, uh, in the CIS neighborhood. So there is a basis for discussion, no mm. doubt. And it has to be on the security architecture, which should uh, then, um, you know, take into account the concerns of both Russia and Ukraine. That's what needs to be worked out, and that's where the negotiation lies. But at the moment, nobody's talking of negotiation. Right. And I think for some more time, at least for another 10, right. 15 days, that's not going to change. Right. And what also uh, did you feel about President Putin's speech, his reference to Saudi Arabia, praising Saudi Arabia, backing China's stand over Taiwan, uh, calling Narendra Modi a patriot. So how do you see all these comments that were made uh, by Putin there? Well, some of them were, were in response to questions, but yes, he is uh, playing all the cards that he should be. Uh, with Saudi Arabia, as you know, they have reached agreement on the quantum of oil that would be available uh, in the international market. Uh, with China, there is a close friendship that is still in position. And with India, we have a long-standing uh, partnership and friendship in place. 
So it is but natural that he would uh, make references to these, uh, especially before an international audience, and where there are people from these countries present amongst them, mm -hmm. and where media would be uh, putting forward questions on these sort of issues. So nothing surprising in my view. Right. I think it is um, an mm -hmm. uh, He has always taken this uh, opportunity of these long three to four hour um, uh, sessions with uh, uh, at Valdai or with the Russian media uh, to present his views on a number of issues. And this mm -hmm. is one opportunity for him to clarify issues in which he feels that enough clarity mm -hmm. was not there and to put forward, uh, you know, and convey uh, noises of friendship and goodwill where he thinks it would work in his interest. And that would be the logical thing for him to do, frankly. Right. Right. Uh, you know, this has been asked again and again, um, Ambassador Malhotra, as to what is the trajectory of this war. Uh, how much support uh, does President Putin have from his own people? How much of the military wherewithal do they have to continue with this war momentum for the next uh, year or so? Uh, well, if you see, you know, there are several wars that are taking place at the same time. You have a social media war which the West uh, and the Americans have won hands down. It's a no contest out there. They've kept the Russian, uh, you know, state media out of it, etc. So you get only one side of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the views that should be out there. Uh, you have the internal uh, projections that is there, and in in Russia and up there, I think Putin has um, uh, very comfortably maintained uh, his control. Uh, at one stage, in fact, throughout this period. Uh, the support that he has had has been uh, um, hovering around 80 percent. It used to be less before. At one stage, it was at 55, 56 percent. And this is as per the Levada polls, the Levada center polls. And even after they announced um, a partial mobilization, the numbers came down only 5 or 6 percent. And in fact, every time he has such mm. a, a media event where he projects himself uh, for three, four hours, uh, the past pattern has been that his support as per so uh, the independent polling organizations to the extent that they are independent in Russia and Levada is counted as independent mm. uh, the support he gets goes up by a good uh, five to six percent but by any criteria a support base mm. of 75 to 80 percent is a very solid support base which I think any world leader would aspire for and that uh, Putin very much has in position mm. uh, there are other wars going on out there, right. the financial and economic war, you know, with the, the West trying to put sanctions, mm. which have not really succeeded. They have boomeranged to a large extent on Europe in particular. Mm. And if you see the ruble has strengthened from, mm. is now at 61 to a dollar. Mm. Uh, the price of Brent crude is, uh, still right. remains high to, at present, still 96 to a dollar. So if you look at all those things, the Russian economy, at one stage, they said will decline by 20% this year. Now they're talking of maybe 4% decline, and perhaps not even that much. So mm. I don't think that war also, mm. that war has probably not gone in um, the direction that the West had hoped for. And if you see the others, you have a, mm. also a cybersecurity war. You have private American companies involved in supporting US intelligence efforts out there, Microsoft, for example. Uh, you have um, uh, Starlink and Elon Musk and uh, all that they have been doing by providing support through their um, microsatellites. So that also is uh, one warfare that is taking place. Again, up here the Russians have not moved against uh, U.S. private sector, uh, which shows that you know when they talk of a, right. it, it is a, a, what they call a special military operation. It is a limited sort of war that they're doing. They haven't really used their full force. Right. Uh, they haven't really used much of the equipment. Mm. As I see it, what they have been doing is trying to whack and destroy as much of the West equipment as they can and staying ready in case a NATO attack mm. does uh, ever eventually take place. The Russians cannot ignore that and they are ready for that. I think they've had eight years to prepare right. for this and they've made mistakes, right. yes. I think uh, a major one was mm. when their international uh, you know, exchange reserves and gold reserves, uh, three, 300 billion plus were seized by the West. Uh, I don't think they had <laughs> right. planned on that, but they have quickly recovered it uh, as a result of the okay. higher oil price. Within the month itself, they got that amount back. So yeah, uh, there's all warfare. Right. It is Master not all out war. All out war would have been, they would have devastated. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately, Ambassador Malhotra, but I think you summed it up well that Putin and Russia have been preparing for this war. Yes, the sanctions have had an impact on Russia, but they do have the wherewithal to continue uh, with this war effort. Thank you very much for summing up the situation in Ukraine and Russia for our viewers. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Globalize. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.